Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Uh, we are doing a joint webinar with uh, Melissa Heinz from Planned Parenthood here with us today, talking about accessing reproductive health care for survivors. Uh, we want to make sure that survivors have all of the information as possible, and there are some things that they themselves can do, as well as healthcare providers during the, the exam, that they can do to help minimize or mitigate any possible re-traumatization that comes up. Uh, Melissa and I have been in contact for several months um, on making sure that we have this webinar for you. So Melissa is a former sexual assault nurse examiner and is a current nurse practitioner clinician at Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. She's going to be here presenting the content for you today. Um, this is um, a part, this webinar here is a part of um, the SAP webinar series, the Sexual Assault Prevention webinar series. Um, we have multiple webinars focused for survivors, and our next one is on March 23rd at 1 p.m. with Aaron Evans, who is a current WACASA board member and a therapist. Um, he is going to be doing a webinar for male survivors. Um, an announcement and registration will be coming out soon through all of the same channels that have been done for this webinar. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that. And I am going to turn it over to Melissa. Again, please feel free to ask any questions that you might have. You can unmute yourself and ask verbally, or you can put them in the chat, or you can also private message me, whatever feels um, good for you. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Melissa. Um, I appreciate your time and expertise, and welcome. Thank you so much. I am uh, really happy to be here. and excited uh, to talk about um, this topic. Um, it's kind of new and emerging and um, more and more medical professionals are starting to kind of get into it. Seeing more and more um, conferences and um, education for providers on trauma-informed care. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and if I can get this, bear with me. I'm good at what I do, but I'm not always really, really good at technology. So um, it looks good. Good. Excellent. So as Angie <laughs> said, uh, I'm Melissa Heinz. I'm a nurse practitioner with Planned Parenthood in their Eau Claire clinic. Uh, we've got a, a little over 20 clinics in the state of Wisconsin. I have been working in the field of medicine for about 40 years and uh, nursing for 20 years worked in labor and delivery. I've been a public health nurse. Um, I've also been a public health nurse practitioner working in the reproductive clinic. And I have been with um, Planned Parenthood now for almost six years. Um, I have uh, been a SANE nurse. I've gone through the whole training. I have gone through a couple of different stints working um, on the side uh, doing sexual assault exams. Um, and I also went uh, to Virginia and uh, became certified uh, in forensic nursing, which is very interesting. Uh, basically, uh, I saw a need um, to help victims. The, the post-assault um, time is just so difficult, and there's so much re-traumatization. And you know, I always hear about those really horror stories about the ER and the exams, and I just felt like this was something that I could do to help out uh, survivors. Um, so that's why I got into that. So the objectives for today, um, I want to help you to feel safe with your medical providers. I want you to feel empowered that you've got choices in your health care. And I want you to feel respected, heard, and seen. And also then we'll talk about the services that Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin can provide you as well. I mean, this is for you. Uh, this is to educate you on your patient rights. You always get those handouts, you know, when you first go to a provider, but these are your rights as, as a person who's experienced trauma. I want to empower you so that you can choose what kind of um, medical, uh, what kind of health care you want and how you want to experience it. And I want to encourage you to ask, um, talk to your medical providers. Do you have trauma-informed care at your clinic or your healthcare facility and making sure that they are um, <clears throat> providers that are at least taking that vantage point and want to work with you to make a more positive healthcare experience. 
So when we talk about trauma, um, 70% of U.S. adults have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. That's huge. That's a lot of people. Psychological trauma is the emotional and physical response to experiencing an event or witnessing an event that is dangerous, threatening, frightening, life-threatening. Um, it's anything. It's really anything that can cause a continued negative reaction. Um, it could be, in my husband's case, a very uh, significant childhood medical uh, trauma, having to go through multiple surgeries uh, as a very young child. You know, for a lot of people, childbirth is an extremely traumatic uh, event, and you kind of, there are certain things that bring you back to that, but um, it's different for everybody. It's very individual, so it's whatever you say it is. Um, trauma can occur as violence, abuse. It can be neglect. I think for a lot of people, it's neglect for loss, disaster, war, as the Ukrainians know right now, any other emotionally harmful experiences. And the thing is that the effects of trauma often can affect many areas of a person's life, medical, psychological, social, economic, educational. You think about all the ways that trauma affects you, whether it's time off of work or not being able to go back to work if, if any kind of the event took place there or there's anything that's triggering there. Um, you know, it may have affected your living arrangements, um, just a variety of ways that trauma can, can stay with us and affect all areas of our, of our life. Um, health effects of trauma. Uh, can cause an absent or delayed medical care for acute or chronic medical conditions. Um, you know, some people will have a fear of medical personnel, you know, having, you know, just the unknown of what to, you know, what's going to happen when they're in this clinic, um, having to disclose what happened to them, just not knowing the people or how accepting or understanding they're going to be. So that keeps people from going in and getting the care that they need. Um, some people can be re-traumatized by medical exams and procedures. Unfortunately, a lot of the OB and gynecological um, treatments and even testing, you know, does, is very intimate and it can be very re-traumatizing to people. It can be triggering. Um, and that's a big word that we hear a lot now as well, because it kind of brings back anything that kind of puts you back in that moment of trauma is considered a trigger, triggering event. So, and that unfortunately has to happen a lot um, in a lot of the, the kind of work that we do in Planned Parenthood. We also see an increase in alcohol and drug use. Um, and for some people, it's just kind of escaping that whole uh, traumatic experience. Um, and also an increase in high risk or self-harm behavior. So for some people experience trauma in a way that they just stop feeling. They don't feel anything anymore. And for them, sometimes uh, self-harm or just that risk of doing something is a feeling. And that is a way that they can experience, you know, re-traumatization. So how can we help? So one of the things we can do is basically we're, we're putting an increased focus on the impact of trauma. As, as um, the field of medicine, we're saying, hey, we notice, we know that this is important. We know that People that have experienced trauma need a little extra attention, a little extra care. Um, they need to know that they're being heard and being seen. So we're really trying to focus on that and gain a better understanding of how to address it. How can we make the whole medical um, experience easier for you? Um, we're working on new methods to decrease re-traumatization. Um, and we'll talk about some of those here in just a little bit. And then we're also working to connect patients to resolve the symptoms and effects of trauma. So we see ourselves sometimes as a connection. You come in to see us a Planned Parenthood for whatever um, healthcare need you have. We like to take a look at the whole, whole person. And that's something that nursing automatically does. We take a holistic look, say, you know, we understand that sometimes you, the effects of trauma that you've experienced make it more difficult for you to um, you know, get through life. Like I said, you know, work, go to work if that's an area that's that's frightening or unsafe to you. Um, you know, can we 
help connect you to, you know, job resource? Can we help connect you to other mental health resources? You know, is there anything else that, that you might need that we can provide resources for? So what exactly is trauma-informed care? Um, kind of basically what it sounds like, you know, we understand that um, people have experienced care and we realize that we're informed about it and we want to make sure the care that we give you um, is, is not re-traumatizing and is respectful of what you've experienced. <clears throat> so basically it's a strategy or intent of providing health care to a patient. And actually for, for the, um, the, the larger facilities and the medical um, clinics and such, there's an actual um, outline of how to do this, how to look at the whole process from intake, from the person doing billing, uh, the person that's going to take your blood pressure, um, so that everybody in the whole clinic, every step of the way is trauma-informed and, and is going at their, their job and what they have to do for you with that intent and that they are, are want to be um, understanding. It also involves recognizing, understanding, responding to the effects of trauma that you've experienced. So we want to respond. We want to say, hey, we know that you've experienced something and we want to help. We want to make this uh, creating a safe space to receive medical care and decreasing the chances of re-traumatizing patients. So what specifically does this mean for you as a patient? We've made changes to how we provide service to our patients, to provide care in a safe and comfortable environment. We'll work with our patients and individualize their appointment, knowing each person experiences trauma differently. Most importantly, we're going to listen. We're going to allow you as the patient to make choices in how you receive your care. For a lot of people, the experience of an assault is a loss of control. And I think one of the main concepts of trauma-informed care is to give back control uh, to you as a patient and let you make decisions about um, the care you receive and how you receive it and um, you know many of the aspects of it. Also changes the power differential. I know a lot of people when they go into a medical clinic, um, you know, the, the doctor is this, you know, kind of, you know, higher than thou kind of person that knows everything. And, you know, some people, you know, walk in and they just, they feel like there's no power. Like this person's going to tell me what I have to do when I have to do it. And, and that power differential can be very uncomfortable in trying to navigate that whole medical system. So one of the areas um, that trauma-informed care uh, revolves around is safety. We want to create an environment for your appointment that feels both physically and emotionally safe. We want you to know that, that we're going to do everything we can to protect you. Um, we're going to ask you about your experiences so we can better understand what might be triggering. But we're okay if you choose not to share. Um, there are just some times that we'll ask a lot of the, we, we do have a series of what we call IPV questions or interpersonal um, violence questions. And it's pretty standard uh, across the uh, field of medicine. We have a lot of people who choose not to, or just answer no to everything. And you know, we can tell that there's something going on. And, and sometimes just that knowing is enough for us. It's like, okay, we're, we're going to be you know, really thoughtful moving forward from this part of the appointment and understanding that there might be something this patient has experienced that we're not understanding or we don't know. And, and that's all right. We respect that. Um, we're going to allow you to bring in, as, as uh, Sam, my assistant, will say, an emotional support human or allowing you to be alone uh, when you want to talk to your staff. So you can do either one. I mean, we have we have to have you by yourself for a few moments when we do ask those intimate partner violence questions because we want you to have a safe space to answer questions um, without somebody standing there in case you do need some help or you are in an unsafe situation. Um, but if you want that emotional support human to come in and be with you for the rest of the time, they want to hold your hand while you're going through an exam, absolutely. 
we're, we're okay with that. And then confidentiality, to know that everything that we talk about is confidential, um, that, you know, you can tell us everything. And if you're emotional support human comes in afterwards, we're not going to talk about the things we talked about before, unless you bring them back up and you're comfortable doing that. So confidentiality is huge, especially at Planned Parenthood, um, huge on, on confidentiality. Um, and then also um, <clears throat> trustworthiness and transparency. So we want to provide you with the expectations for the visit right at the, from the bat. This is what we're going to do. This is the kind of exam I have to do. This is kind of testing that we think should happen. And we're going to ask for permission before and during each step of that exam. You know, so I will talk to a patient. It's like, okay, I'm going to move the, the paper drape and I'm going to, you know, get the speculum in. I'm going to be touching you now. I'm going to touch the side of your leg. I'm going to put the speculum in, what to expect. And try to each step along the way, you know, asking for permission. Is it okay if I put this in? Is it okay if I pull back the drape? Um, just so that you know that that you have the choice. And if you need time or you're just like, nope, I, I can't do this today. Okay, we get it. You know, we'll, we'll try again another day. We'll try to figure out what we need to know another way. Um, we'll work with you. We also letting you know what we're going to do with the results of the testing. There are um, a few tests, some of the sexually transmitted infections. Um, if you test positive, we do have to report that to state. It's um, done in a very confidential manner. And, you know, the public health department sometimes can bring that um, information and then have to follow up to make sure that everybody's getting treated. But again, everybody, everything is confidential. Um, and then there's, you know, certainly some legal ways that that sometimes we'll have to uh, break confidentiality, but we really try to let you know that ahead of time when and if we're going to need to break any type of that confidentiality. Empowerment and choice. And I think these are, you know, I think they're all important, but I think empowerment and choice is so huge because the loss of that choice, the loss of empowerment, the loss of control is such a huge part of um, assault and trauma. Um, giving you back that control, giving you th back that, that choice, I think is very important. You can choose to decline answering any of our questions. And we unfortunately have to ask some pretty nosy questions. And we do it basically because we need to find out how, what, what do we need to, what services do we need to provide for you? What kind of testing do you need? Testing from certain sites on the body, et cetera. Um, so we ask a lot of questions that seem very uncomfortable and we're okay if you decide not to answer them. You get to choose what services you receive. If you come in for STI testing, but you're not on a birth control method, we may offer it to you, but if you don't want to do that, we're good to go. That's fine. If you know you might be at risk of pregnancy, but you don't want a pregnancy test, we, we don't have to do that. So we will give you that choice of what services. You can tell us how you prefer to be addressed, <clears throat> both your name and your pronouns. And we will respect those. Uh, <clears throat> we have a pretty significant transgender population in our practice, and we're very um, <clears throat> cognizant of the importance of using those uh, preferred pronouns and name. Uh, we will do self-collected specimens whenever possible. And fortunately, uh, we've gotten the green light to do almost all, except for the um, the actual. Uh, cervical cancer screening and screening for yeast and bacterial vaginosis, everything else, all the STI testing, whether it's uh, rectal, pharyngeal, genital, all can be self-collected. So uh, for most women, a urine specimen or a self-collected vaginal swab can test for most of the sexual transmitted infections that are out there. So that's a really been a great thing to kind of help. Also, um, if you so desire, we will let you do a self-insertion of the speculum for vaginal exams. Uh, we also um, have lots of, of information about how to do that. Also, just how to do your own exam if you decide that you want to do that <laughs> at home. Um, but sometimes uh, for some people, putting that speculum uh, inside their vagina feels, again, like they have the control. It's not somebody doing something to you. You have the control. Um, you can stop any part of the appointment or the exam at any time. We're okay with that. We understand. You know, some days it's just not the right day and that's okay. We'll reschedule. We can do what we need to do. We'll help you through that. 
um, you can limit the amount of people involved in your visit. You know, unfortunately, with most most uh, medical facilities, you know, you've got one or two people that you talk to at the front desk. You know, then you've got somebody that takes you back to your room and gets your vitals and kind of gets a little bit of information about what you're there for. And then you've got the provider coming in um, and going through some of that stuff. If you absolutely are uh, wanting to limit the amount of people involved in your care, we may need the person up front to collect some demographic information, insurance stuff, and then we can take over. I can jump in and, and get you from the rest of the way through, do all of the vital signs, ask the questions that which I know can be uncomfortable um, and complete the whole exam. And that way you've limited the amount of people you have to tell your story to. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I'm not clicking through here. There we go. All right, so um, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin, how can we help? Um, we do offer uh, sexually transmitted infection testing, um, post-assault testing, and we can also presumptively treat. And what that means is if, you know, you have absolutely no knowledge about what you might have been exposed to, so there's some things, some sexually transmitted infections, we can just give you treatment right, right away, just knowing that, you know, you may have been exposed. Um, we can do screening if you have new partners. We can do, if you just want to come in and you just want peace of mind, I want to know that I don't have anything right now. We can do that. We can test for um, a variety of things, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomoniasis, uh, mycoplasma genitalium. That's a new one that uh, is just now being talked about. Um, it didn't ever used to be able to be commercially tested because it takes six months to grow in a Petri dish instead of that two days like most things. So with the new testing, which tests the DNA of um, <clears throat> the different infections, um, it's easier to test for now. We can test for and treat syphilis, uh, which is on the rise in Wisconsin, unfortunately. Um, we're also seeing some uh, what we call congenital syphilis, which is uh, babies being born with it. <clears throat> um, we can do HIV testing. We have a rapid HIV test in our clinic, and we can also send it to the lab for uh, confirmatory as well. Um, <clears throat> we can also provide emergency contraception. We uh, have our generic version of Plan B. We have Ella, which is a prescription emergency contraception. And also uh, both the hormonal, like the Mirena and the Lilata IUDs, and the Paragard or Copper IUD can be used as um, <clears throat> emergency contraception. Emergency contraception is either a device or a medication that you can take up to five days after unprotected intercourse. Um, so post-assault, um, condom breaks, missed your pill, IUD came out, whatever the situation might be. Um, most of the medications are progesterone-based. So the IUD that has hormones is progesterone only. Basically just stops you from ovulating is what it does. Uh, keeps you from you know releasing that egg. The only time it's not completely effective is if you have already just ovulated. Um, otherwise, that's why it's not 100% but very, very effective. Ella, the prescription is probably a little bit more effective, especially if you have a higher BMI um, or it's like three, four or five days after unprotected intercourse, that effectiveness is much higher. Um, so that's a little bit about emergency contraception. Um, we also off offer a variety of birth control methods. Um, you know, we've got, of course, the pill, the patch, the ring, depot. We also now have a program where uh, we can provide subcutaneous depot, and that's where you can take, um, we'll deliver the, the depot shot to you, and you can give that to yourself at your home, which is really nice. We have a program um, where when you have pill, patch, ring, or the subcutaneous depot, that uh, we automatically can mail out your birth control when it's time for it to be renewed. Um, which is a really nice um, feature for us. I'm up in Eau Claire and we have a lot of rural patients that are, you know, even over an hour away. And so for them, it's a whole lot easier not to have to come back to the clinic and pick up their supplies or get their depo shot. We also uh, do the next plan on implant, which goes under the arm. And uh, we provide both the hormonal, Lilata or Mirena, and um, <clears throat> non-hormonal or Paragard IUD. The other thing we can do is talk to you about what birth control method might be best for you based on your needs. You know, we can kind of help guide you. Some people come in and they ask, like, I have no idea. 
well, what's most important to you? Is it the ease of use? Is it that I can stop it at any moment I want to? Is it I can leave it in, forget about it, and it's there for five years like the implant or eight years or 12 years like the IUDs? Um, is it something that you want to want to be versatile? If I don't like this pill, I can go to a different pill. So we can talk to you about all of those different things and help help guide you based on what your needs are to find the birth control method that's right for you. Um, we also do uh, preventative visits. Um, cervical cancer screening, which has undergone a huge change um, <clears throat> recently um, in, in uh, when people need to get a pap. I know for some of us older people, we used to have to start getting a pap at age 15 or 14 or whenever you started having sex, and then you got one every single year. Well, you know, not long ago, they changed that to every three years. And then after you were 30, 35 years, well, now, um, instead of starting at age 21, which is what it's been for quite some time, they're starting cervical cancer screening at age 25. And if everything is, is so basically, instead of looking at the cells, which was the uh, gold standard as the pap smear, they're collecting it the same way, but we're testing it for the HPV virus. If the HPV virus is not found five years before you have to do that again. So it's really kind of nice. Um, it's also follow up if you do have an abnormal pap is much more geared to your individual history instead of kind of a broad um, outline. Um, we can do uh, breast exams. We can do, oh, I, are you still seeing my screen? Yes, everything's okay. good. It's the same slide that you've been on. Ah, there it is. Um, mine disappeared for a moment. Uh, we do breast, um, uh, clinical breast exams. We'll talk to you about self-breast awareness. They've kind of moved away from the self-breast exam that you do monthly in the shower to more of a self-breast awareness. Getting to know what your breast tissue is like. Where are the normal bits of breast tissue? How does it feel on your particular breast? Would you know if there was something new or different that showed up? That's kind of the goal with self-breast awareness. Um, you know, we'll talk to you just about health and wellness. If we are noticing that your blood pressure is elevated or you have any other uh, medical concerns that we can um, outline or isolate, you know, we can make re uh, referrals for you. We can help you find um, different um, resources in the area. Each of our clinics has our own uh, particular resource guide. Uh, that is local to that particular clinic. But again, if you're kind of in, in the middle or kind of out in the boonies, we can certainly help you uh, locate and connect with some of those uh, resources as well. So how can you access Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin? So I'm really excited about a couple of these things. I mean, basically we have, you know, the, the, the same old, same old, how do you, you know, get an appointment with any of your providers? Um, you can get a clinic appointment um, and you can get a telemedicine appointment. There's quite a few things that we can do via telemedicine. Um, we can do a lot of the birth control visits, even if you want to do uh, the next plan on or the IUDs, which are LARCs, long acting reversible contraception. Uh, we can do the consult for those on a telemedicine and just make an appointment for you to come in and do the insertion. Um, you can do this by going online at ppwi.org. You click on for patients, you type in your zip code, and then you can choose the health center that you prefer. And then there'll be a drop down of the different services that we offer and you can go ahead and click on one of those. Now, if you prefer, you want to make a phone call so you can speak to someone who kind of set that up for you. I've got the number here. 800-230-7526, and then somebody can go ahead and help you. The other thing which is super exciting to me, and I've worked with this um, platform for a while, is PP Direct. PP Direct is an app. You can download it onto your computer or to your phone, and you can actually access um, birth control, the pill, patch, or the ring, or um, uh, services for urinary tract infections or bladder infections. If you're not having any vaginal symptoms and it's strictly a UTI, you can go on. And if you've been a patient of ours, you don't even necessarily have to do the video part of that. You can just um, message back and forth with the provider and get a uh, prescription at the end of that. So it's really convenient. You know, if you're working during most of the clinic hours, things like that, it's a really nice way. 
um, <clears throat> to be able to receive care. And I wanted to zoom back. One of the things that I forgot that I wanted to talk about that we can offer is the HPV vaccine. Uh, we have that here in our clinics, and that is the first vaccine that we have that actually is against a cancer. It helps prevent cervical, um, oral pharyngeal, and rectal cancers. It's a series of three uh, vaccines. Um, some people will have started to get them um, in middle school. Um, and it is definitely made a huge, this is why that we've been able to change that whole cervical cancer screening because so many people have gotten that HPV vaccine that it's, it's really changed how much of the high risk HPV that causes cancer um, is out there. So it's another service we offer. And I have a sip here. So if you've experienced an unplanned pregnancy, there's a lot of services that we can provide you surrounding that. First off, we have high sensitivity pregnancy testing. And I used to say that the pregnancy tests out there at the pharmacies were just as good. But lately, I've had a lot of people coming in uh, where we're not detecting a pregnancy at all. And they've had a couple of negative and a couple positive uh, pregnancy tests. So definitely, it's super inexpensive to come in um, and get uh, just a pregnancy test for peace of mind. I think it's only like $10. So um, it's, you know, it's an appointment, but it probably is, is about what you paid for at uh, Walgreens. Um, we can provide you a statement of pregnancy as well as dating and estimating the delivery date. Um, and that statement of pregnancy used to be for Badger Care because once you're pregnant, you're automatically covered under Badger Care if you don't have other qualifying um, insurance. Um, and for WIC, women, infants, and children, so most of our pregnant patients will automatically refer over that because it is a great program to help support a healthy pregnancy and healthy children. We can connect you to resources for prenatal care. Um, we'll provide you with uh, prenatal vitamins, uh, we'll help connect you again, like to WIC. They also have a public health nurse uh, program through WIC uh, called the Nurse um, Family Partnership. And you'll have a public health nurse that'll follow you uh, up through two years after the pregnancy is, as, after you've delivered, uh, which is awesome. And they also have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of free giveaways and things like that, but really good at connecting with resources and providing um, education and information and support. Um, we can connect you up with adoption uh, resources, you know, in your local area, if that's your, your choice. And then we can also um, at least help guide you with abortion if you decide that you want to terminate that pregnancy. Melissa? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. You did talk about STIs, but I'm wondering if you can give more information on if uh, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin provides treatment slash medications to folks if they test positive. For absolutely, yes, and absolutely. What this might be sure. So, um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomoniasis, mycoplasma genitalia, syphilis are all bacterial infections. We can treat those with antibiotics. Um, syphilis is an injection of, of penicillin. Um, <clears throat> For chlamydia, they have changed. <clears throat> it used to be uh, like a single dose of a medication, and now um, some chlamydia has gotten to the point where it's uh, become resistant um, to that medication. So uh, we now uh, usually it's doxycycline, and it's a week long medication. Um, gonorrhea is um, an injection um, and an oral medication. And then trichomoniasis is um, metronidazole, which is a little bit different type of an antibiotic, but uh, works the same way. It's a seven day um, as well. Now we carry all of those medications in our clinic. So our patients that either are private pay, um, have badger care, have um, family planning only services, which is the division of badger care, but um, much more people can qualify. I think it's up to 300% of the poverty. Um, so it does encompass a lot, much larger population of people. And it covers, um, you know, reproductive health at 100%. It, it covers STI testing, treatment, birth control, EC, condoms, uh, your preventative visits, the whole thing. Um, so all those patients, we can provide that medication here. Even some of our patients that um, have private insurance, 
if we can save you a trip to the uh, pharmacy, our prices for our medications are really um, extremely competitive. I would say uh, we just we we bring them at cost. We really not we're make, not making any money on those, um, and so it is very affordable. So is our laboratory testing. If you were to compare our prices to those that you'd get if you were at one of the larger facilities, you'd probably be amazed at how. Um, how much more affordable it is to get a lot of those services through us. But yes, we do. We are talking about that, Melissa. We got a question sent to me wondering about if folks don't have insurance or if they don't have the funds to pay for the cost of treatment, um, medications, or any exams that they might have. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit more about how I know you're not a, a billing person, so That's okay. we send that information out in an email. Um, but I'm wondering if you can touch more about that process and what that might look like for folks who maybe don't want to charge their insurance or can't um, afford the treatments or if they don't have insurance altogether. Sure. So the first thing I would suggest is go to access.gov. And that's going to help you determine if you are eligible um, for Badger Care or the Family Planning Only Services. And it basically, it's it's income-based. It does not include um, a spouse or anybody else living in the household. It is yours on your own. Um, so again, a lot of people will qualify. Now, if you don't qualify for those, um, we have a uh, an assistance, a family planning assistance program where you get, um, I think like 75% off the cost of services. And to be quite honest, you know, we, you know, it, you pay what you can. If you come in, you don't have anything to pay that day, go ahead. That's fine. We are not going to deny you services because you can't pay. We're not going to make you pay ahead of time. Um, that's not what we're, we're I think, as our, as our uh, motto says, care no matter what. So that's our number one um, focus is making sure that you come in and get the care that you need. Yeah, my only access to medical care when I was in my 20s was reproductive health care because I didn't have insurance. And I was able to get all of my health care needs and whatever birth control I needed at the time without cost because I was a college student and didn't, you know, have, you know, income that could pay for stuff like that and didn't have a job that provided insurance. So I feel like that is a really important piece to remember if you are, you know, limited income um, and need assistance, you know, always ask about that just in case, because um, reproductive health care is uh, super important for a lot of preventative measures. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so we are, you know, just know that our number one goal is to give you the care that you need, the treatment that you need. Um, if it's something that we cannot actually take care of, we'll help connect you to resources that can, and we'll we'll work with you on all of that. So, care no matter what. All right, I think it was here. So I wanted to just touch base a little bit about some of the changes, um, the legal changes to uh, abortion access in our state. Um, in June of last year. Uh, the Supreme Court Dobbs decision moved decisions about abortion access out of the federal government and into the, each state. So each state then gets to determine, you know, what uh, how they're going to provide abortion access or not, as the case may be. Well, unfortunately, Wisconsin had an old law back from 1849, went back into effect. So it's like an automatic switch. That makes abortion at any time in the pregnancy illegal, except in cases where the mother's life is in imminent danger. <clears throat> that whole imminent danger thing has been a really difficult stickler because how imminent is imminent? You know, it's it's been a very vague concept. And, you know, for some uh, providers, you know, because the, the penalties are so severe, you know, if you've got somebody who's got a um, an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy outside of the uterus and in the uh, fallopian tube, that is not a pregnancy that can continue because um, it will kill the mother before the pregnancy can can ever come to fruition. So that's mother's life is in danger. Well, how imminent is it? But and that's been a, a an area where it's been a little bit. Um, 
difficult for some people to obtain the kind of appropriate and life-saving care that they need um, because a lot of providers are a little bit nervous about, you know, is that imminent enough? Um, <clears throat> what this has kind of done is it required uh, those that are pursuing abortion for any reason um, to go out of state for this care. Um, that's been just really unfortunate. Fortunately for us in Wisconsin, we have some surrounding states that are um, much more accessible. Uh, Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan provide abortion services. Um, and Wisconsin residents are legally able to obtain care in those states. It is legal to go out of the state and to obtain that abortion care. Uh, Minnesota and Illinois, you need to have two visits at least 24 hours apart. But the first one can be a phone consultation. So I know for us in Eau Claire, a lot of our patients will go to uh, Minnesota because it's closer and because that first one is a phone call. And so they only need to make one trip over there to the clinic. Um, in all cases, an ultrasound is required and both medication and clinical abortions are available. And I'll kind of review a little bit about each of those in a minute. In Michigan, uh, it also requires two visits 24 hours apart, but they both have to be in person. So uh, the first type of uh, abortion service available is a medication abortion. Um, basically, it's two separate medications. You're going to take one medication when you're there for your second appointment at the clinic. Um, and it's at the end of the appointment. So you know, they do the ultrasound. The second medication you're going to take at home when you're ready to um, have that pregnancy come out, you're going to take that second medication, usually within about 24 hours or so of taking that first medication. It offers privacy to complete the procedure at home, does not require a patient to have a driver for the appointment. Um, it does require a follow-up appointment within about one to four weeks, make certain that the procedure was complete, kind of follow you until uh, you get a negative pregnancy test. The other type of abortion is an in-clinic abortion or sometimes called a surgical abortion. <clears throat> Requires you to have a driver as some of the medications that they provide you uh, to make the procedure a little bit more comfortable can make you a little bit uh, sleepy. It uses a gentle suction to remove the pregnancy and the process is complete before you leave the clinic. So you have that, you have that knowledge that, yep, it's, it's, we're good to go. It's, it's done. There's, there's, everything's good. Um, it also can be completed about several weeks further into the pregnancy um, than the medication abortion can. So there, I did put on here um, some other abortion resources. Uh, we do have all three of the Planned Parenthood organizations for uh, North Central States, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, also, uh, the Guttmacher organization, a lot of good information there about abortion in various states. And then also the abortionfinder.org. And if you, no matter where you are in the United States, you can click onto that and get information about um, where you can find an abortion or abortion care in all of the uh, states. We can also help you, um, even though we can't actually do the procedure, we can still help you. We have um, <clears throat> new job positions that we call abortion navigators. A um, couple of our providers that worked in our uh, abortion clinics, they can connect you with appointments, assist with travel and other expenses. And you can either call them at this number here or you can um, email to abnav at ppwi.org and then they can email you um, information that you might be requesting. Also, our Madison, Milwaukee, and Sheboygan clinics can provide you with a pregnancy assessment and ultrasound prior to traveling out of state. So that you have the information that you need, maybe about how far along the pregnancy is. Is it, you know, a viable pregnancy in a uterus or is it something more concerning? Um, can give you some of that information as well. And you can go on to PPWI. Dot org, uh, which is our main website for Wisconsin, or uh, call the phone number here. Oh, I... My screen keeps disappearing. Bear with me. <clears throat> we 
We can also help connect you to other care. So people that have experienced uh, post-abortion concerns, whether it's uh, symptoms afterwards or just feeling, you know, kind of any kind of emotions about it. We've got uh, ways that we can connect you up with resources to help you out with that. Um, sexual assault counseling, of course, one of the things that I always do is, is encourage people to check out their CASA um, locations in our area. Um, I send a lot of people there. And then we also have a couple other resources that we can send people. Um, if you just want basic mental health services, we can uh, support you with that. Other resources you may need. Now, Eau Claire has an awesome um, <clears throat> resource guide for the entire county, whether it's jobs, um, you know, food, uh, health care, um, just about anything at all that you might need. Um, it's got a really nice little brochure there. And we can work with a lot of those partners as well. A free clinic and things like that. So um, we can connect you up. We can do a little soft referrals by giving you information. We can even call them and help you set up an appointment. All right. Well, I think that is all the information that I have today, but I am absolutely happy to answer any questions that you might have. So please go ahead. Yeah, well, folks are typing or thinking of things. I just wanted to thank you again, Melissa, this um, accessing healthcare after, whether it's a week after or 10 years after can be re-traumatizing. Uh, re so um, letting folks know what their uh, rights are during exams and just basic reproductive healthcare just in general is super important. So thank you so much well, you're for welcome. this. Yeah, folks were asking questions in the chat, but please feel free so again, unmute yourself or type questions in the chat, um, whichever you feel most comfortable with. Do you want me to review the questions in the chat and, and go after them, or do you want to present them? If oh, we have we have one that pops up. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, someone is asking how secure is the Planned Parenthood app uh, that you talked about. I will tell you that I think all of our all of our systems are very very secure. Um, I have not heard of any kind of problems with that app. Um, <clears throat> I know hackers try all the time. Uh, we are so very very much about um, confidentiality that um, we go to extremes. There's sometimes it's services we don't offer, like we don't have like a patient portal for just that reason. Um, so I feel like the Planned Parenthood app is is very, very secure. Wonderful, thanks, Melissa. So another question, going back to the funds, okay. are there options to assist clients in affording the required trips to neighboring states to uh, access abortion care? There, there are some funds available through various areas. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it covers the full amount or if it just provides a bit of a stipend, but I know that there is um, some funding and I know some of it has come from private donors to assist with that particular, uh, those particular travel needs. Yeah, I, I, I know after uh, the Dobbs decision was announced that there were a lot of abortion funds that we're receiving just like an influx of donations. Right, right. So people are recognizing that there is a need for that. And I think each fund is different, right? Like right. there's gonna be different types of things that they that they um focus on dependent upon donations or whatever. And there's a there's a quite a few in Wisconsin um that you can access from the link that I just put in the chat. It was also listed in um, Melissa's presentation, abortionfunds.org. Um, we at Wakasa, if you are a service provider here on this call, um, recommend that you know what funds are in your area. Um, you don't have to know the ins and outs again um, for, for a lot of these things, but just know what is available um, in your area. And we have another question. So uh, this is from a service provider um, who runs, uh, who has a shelter. Um, okay. I heard the birth control by mail option allows clients to select a specific shelter address for mailing. Um, mm -hmm. and 
they're wondering if that is correct um, and if it doesn't have to be their home address. Absolutely. We've got, excuse me a moment. <clears throat> we do have patients that have it delivered to, um, you know, their uh, roommate's house, their parents' house, their, their, um, any, any friend or acquaintance of theirs, we can send it to the shelter. <clears throat> I don't, I don't think we can send it to a PO box, but yes. Thank you for all the questions, folks. And if there's some, uh, keep keep them coming. We have a, a, we have several minutes left. Um, and if questions do pop up, like my breast, my best brain space, and things that I think about happen at three o'clock in the morning when I wake up, and my dreams are like thinking about all these things. So please feel free to um, connect with with me at Wakasa. Um, and I can connect with Melissa or Melissa, I'm not sure how you feel about sharing your email address in the chat. Um, if not, if that, if that is not something that you can do, please feel free to send me an email and I can connect with Melissa. And then there is a question um, asking if the slides, um, if you feel comfortable sharing your slides. Oh, absolutely. Okay. When we send out the recording, um, I will also include a PDF of the slides from today. I'm typing in my... All right. <clears throat> so I've got my uh, email address in there. If you don't hesitate to... Uh... Ask any questions at all. Um, we've worked. We've been working a lot with uh, Planned Parenthood um, over the months since the the um, reproductive health landscape in Wisconsin has changed, um, and we're going to continue this partnership because this is a um, healthcare reproductive healthcare for survivors. Um, is a, a foundational piece of what WACASA um, is doing, right? Is making sure that survivors have access to all the care that they might need um, after an assault. Um, so this conversation, this um, the area and this work, this partnership will continue. Um, so again, if questions do pop up um, later on, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask whether you are a service provider on this call today or a survivor yourself um, or both. We do know that survivors are also um, in this field. Um, so yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out um, and connect um, on anything that could help. Uh, uh, Melissa, uh, do you know how many bilingual or and or by cultural staff members that uh, Planned Parenthood in Wisconsin has, or how um, other languages are spoken um, during exams. So in some of our clinics that have a pretty significant um, uh, Spanish speaking population, we do have quite a few bilingual um, staff. Uh, we have a very significantly strong uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, <clears throat> standing in our clinic, in our in our whole administration. And uh, so we do have a very diverse staff as well. We also use a language line. So when we have in our clinic, um, Sam and I have just a real little bit of Spanish, but um, when we've got patients that have other languages, I think there's we have not yet found a language that is not used on our language line. And we can put them, we've got one um, traveling phone and we just take that all the way through with the patient um, into the exam room. And uh, they've done a really fabulous job of um, translating for us. We also have, we also have, um, <clears throat> 
we don't have ESL, but I think we have we have a way to um, pull up a screen uh, with that same thing that also can help um, do sign language uh, for those people that have um, uh, hearing disabilities. Yeah, I, I went into Planned Parenthood Clinic in Milwaukee recently with a friend. I was their person that went with them for medical care. Um, and there is a giant sign um, right by the desk that is very apparent. It's not hidden. It's very visible about um, language access and what that um, and, and what folks can access or what they might need when uh, doing medical care uh, visits. We have another question that has popped up. Um, uh, I'm curious what it will take to have the old law updated. I'm assuming it's referring to the 1849 law. Um, what would the legislature have to look like for that to be updated? Um, without uh, putting myself in a position where I get in trouble for making political comments, I'm just going to say that uh, we we would PPAWI is our advocacy group, and they are working with um, with Wisconsin, Wisconsin uh, lawmakers, legislators, and everything, trying to uh, work on getting that repeal, trying to uh, get that taken care of. Um, you know, we Wisconsin is a very interesting state in that we elected a Democratic governor and we have a very Republican uh, Congress, um, which speaks. Uh, to some interesting um, congressional uh, lines, I would say. So, you know, <clears throat> it's going to take um, letting, letting your lawmakers know how you feel about abortion and that uh, the majority of people feel that abortion care should be up to the patient and their medical provider, that it's that decision. And it does not include a lawmaker, does not include anybody else. Perhaps is in the same boat of being um, a nonprofit and having to uh, stay very separate from those partisan politics. Um, but we had, um, I know that Planned Parenthood advocates the nationwide um, separate entity, and they all have like statewide chapters as well. It does have a lot of information on that um, and can speak to that. So, which is it's, it's an important issue obviously. Um, so absolutely check out Planned Parenthood Advocates of Wisconsin um, for all of that information. I'm going to try to put that in here. Um, I, I do. I have a question on um, how have other healthcare providers who offer women's health services, especially in regards to abortion services, how has the relationship um, been, especially since the Roe versus Wade decision came down um, to going back to the 1849 law? Has, have you, what does that look like with Planned Parenthood and, um, and uh, that relationship? I think it really depends. I mean, most of like the, like the, uh, the major medical um, groups um, like ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the AMA, uh, which is American Medical Association, they are all uh, have spoken out and uh, published in support of access to abortion care because is, abortion care is health care and um, <clears throat> pregnancy mortality exists. Um, people die from getting pregnant. And so the ability to pursue uh, abortion care uh, should should be an equal right all over the United States and not just some states. Thanks. Good to see you, Melissa. Yeah, I was gonna say, good to see you too, Pam. And um, Kelly put in the chat, um, Kelly, the Associate Director of ACASA, um, put in the chat that 
And um, my colleague sent out an action alert email that talked about um, how nonprofits, uh, 501c3s, can um, engage in issue topics like this um, when it comes to politics. Um, so when we send out the follow-up email with the slides, the recording to this uh, presentation, um, and I'll also include any of the links um, that we talked about, but I'm fairly certain are in um, the side, uh, but so I'll double check. I will also include that in the email that we send out. I appreciate all of your time, everyone here and asking questions. Um, so please don't hesitate to pop any more in the chat that any of you may have. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for your time. Um, very much appreciate seeing all of you here. Thank you for letting me come and uh, chat with you all today. And <clears throat> it's an issue very near and dear to me and uh, just glad that it's becoming something that I think is much more standardized in you know major medical health care um, all over the United States that it's starting to recognize the importance of trauma-informed care. Yeah, and also the importance of just basic reproductive health care and how it's not, it's it shouldn't be like an afterthought, right? Like right. it should be like a, a main staple of medical health care for everyone. Um, so I keeping this conversation and, and being able to have this conversation is super important and just reminding people that um, all of our bits and bobs, whether they're internal or external, like they all require, you know, at some point, um, medical care. And we need to make sure that folks have access to all of that, um, regardless of where they are located in, in any of the states or who they are. Um, so this conversation is super important. Absolutely. You know, and just so that people feel comfortable going in and getting everything checked out so that they're not, you know, putting themselves in, in a risky medical position because they're not pursuing care. So we want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable coming in and feels safe and that they have a choice and control and that they're being heard. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. There's some thank yous um, to you, Melissa, for, for being here with us today. Oh, thank um, you again for having me. And thanks for um, all the appreciation and the love uh, seen here um, in the chat. I really appreciate it and uh, love the job I do. Yes. And thank you all again for being here. If there's anything that comes up after today, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you will see the follow-up email in a couple of days. Um, so um, take care of yourselves. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful uh, rest of the day and week. Very good. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.